New York, you know, hip hop and record labels, they were all in that city. You could come across Universal, RCA, uh, Island, you know, all within a, a proximity of each other. It was amazing to see that in Scotland, that whiskey, there's so many distilleries and, and, and farms and, and, and places that this is the export. Yeah. This is where it's created at. Yeah, it's ground central for, for whiskey there. Yeah. We're here, so this is Death & Co, which obviously we're in downtown LA, but this bar started in New York. I think fair to say that anyone who's like a hip hop fan would associate Wu-Tang and New York as being fairly synonymous. Oh, guaranteed. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, how would you think of yourself, you know, in the context of New York, in the context of this place where we're drinking, someone who, you know, is famous for their music, is famous for um, working on some alcohol brands now, and also you've done stuff beyond that, movie work. How would you describe yourself? Well, there's a, a, a title that my Wu-Tang brothers gave to me. They refer to me as the abbot. In Shaolin philosophy, the mm -hmm. abbot is like the lead monk. Like everybody, if there's a situation that you can't figure out by yourself, you go and talk to the abbot. And I think uh, tonight you're sitting here with the abbot. Yeah. <laughs> Good, well, hopefully I'll learn some stuff from you and then maybe I can teach you some stuff about whiskey. Bong, bong. <laughs> You collaborated with Ballantines. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of people, I would say, in the whiskey industry who are into hip hop. Yeah, there's not. A, I don't think there's a lot <laughs> in the sense of publicly known. But I think, you know, whiskey is definitely in all of our shelves, on all of our shelves. I, I think it was also a company called Highest Nobility, mm -hmm. who I had met some years ago, and then they were also working with Ballantine as, a, as their agent or something like that. And it was like, we got a guy who has a very similar path that Mr. Ballantyne had took himself, right? Mm -hmm. so he was a guy who blended different whiskeys together to form his own. And he was a little bit out of the box and people doubted him, but he believed in himself and believed in the thing that he was crafting. He was, as they would say, he was being true to himself. Mm -hmm. And you know, when Wu-Tang came out, one of our coin expressions was keep it real. So being true, and keeping it real are synonymous. And I think because of that, the Ballantyne family and the people that ran the company was like, yeah, RZA makes sense as someone from the hip hop culture that can collaborate with us. So we have your whiskey here today. We've got three okay. bottles. Uh, this is obviously the Ballantyne seven year old, the RZA edition, mm -hmm. the one that you worked on. I thought it might be interesting to bring out this as well. So this is a 30 year old Ballantyne's but this was an older release. So this was released in the mid 80s. Wow. So if it's 30 years old, this is, you know, mid 50s vintage whiskey in here. But I thought that'd be cool to kind of see the difference between the two and the way that you tried to create something that stands outside of that. And then the third whiskey we have, this is a Glenlivet 38 year old from their cellar collection. So obviously these are both blends. This single malt is one of the constituent parts that makes up the core flavor of these. In blending, it's all about the art of bringing different whiskies together and creating something new. Yeah, I mean, and also the blending of culture, you know? When you think about Wu-Tang and, and, you know, we blend in Asian culture, mm -hmm. New York culture, uh, sampling sounds from soul music, rock music, yeah. whatever. So, so hip-hop is an amalgamation of uh, diverse cultures coming together. Mm -hmm. The single malt, of course, one location, one focus, from that one distillery into those barrels and bottles. Uh, there's something special about that. But I think there's also something very special about the blended because it's called age for seven years because there's nothing in this bottle that is younger than seven years, meaning everything in here is seven years or older. But there's some stuff in this bottle that could be up to 25, 30 years old. It's just that the youngest blend is seven years. I was actually trying to make a whiskey that if you like mezcal, you'll leave it alone and drink the whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm interested to try this because I see you've gone all American oak barrels in here. Yeah. Well, 
they, the punchline was to, to, to have, you know, the Scottish heritage and the American attitude. Yeah. That was like, <laughs> that was like the conversation yeah. we was having. I'm interested to find out, like, because obviously you're, you were part of this collaboration and you're bringing your world into the whiskey space. Mm. Like, if, if I think about this as being like an older version of, of, of this, which is like a sort of young newcomer, mm -hmm. is there anything, like, when you think back to your um, career in hip hop, like, do you have, uh, you know, would you have similar things where you think, oh, this is, you know, one of the elders of, of hip hop? What you think about lyrics, lyricists, you know, you go to somebody like uh, Grandmaster Kaz. Yeah. And so Grandmaster Kaz may not be uh, pop famous, but in hip hop culture, he's, he's famous because he's one of the first pioneer top lyricists. Sugar Hill Gang lyrics was a total rip off of Grandmaster Kaz. Yeah. He was a member of a crew called the Cold Crush Four. And, you know, even when Wu-Tang was forming, you know, we thought the Cold Crush was the greatest crew of all time, and we wanted to be better. We're going to start with, with your one here. This is the first time I'm going to be tasting this as well. All right, so I'm interested to see Yeah, 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 yeah. It smells good, huh? So this is like classic blended whiskey for me. Like, it's a very light body. It's got an almost like um, a maraschino cherry kind of thing, which is about the spirit. It shows me there's, a, mm -hmm. there's grain whiskey in there. It's not all single malt. And then on top of that, you have the layers of vanilla, which is coming from that American yeah, from oak. The, from the, yeah, from yeah, the yeah. oak. Yeah, like I said, I was challenged to make, you know, something that could compete against mezcal, but at the same time, you know, whiskey can have uh, the sweetness to it mm -hmm. that is not surface sweetness. Yeah, the smell doesn't show up until it is released by something else that's opposite to it. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah, and there is a little bit of that smoke at the back. Yes. And it, it, I mean, I get what you mean about the mezcal. And a little bit of cheddar. Cheddar? Yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> no. I'm all right with this. Right, there's, I, a, there's a cheesy thing that, yeah, yeah. that your mouth can get. There are certain distilleries that have very farmyardy character or like smoked cheese. Right. And sometimes you'll be like, Oh yeah, that smells like uh, sheep shit. Yeah. And people think you're insane, but it is actually <laughs> right. real. And like, you get some Gouda in here. Yeah, it's, it, sounds, it sounds like it's not gonna be good, but it right. is. It's all part of that world that you create where they're sweet and savory working together. Should we taste it? Should we sure. see how it all comes out? What's, what's the word they use? Slav? Slangeva, so that's ready? what we say, yeah. Okay. So slanja means cheer, slangeva, or it means health. Okay. Slangeva means good Let's health. Let's do that, what? Slangeva. Good for the first drink of the day. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay, nice. No, it says seven year, and I know next we'll go to the thirty year. But I did have a chance to have a bunch of friends over, and we had a twelve year, and people went back to the seven year. Yeah, yeah. Blended whiskey, like the key to it is to have approachability and just enough character for it to sit in its own place right. on the shelf, and I think that does just that. Just to relate to this particularly. I guess when you're producing a tune, 90s New York hip hop, you know, there's the beats and then there's the sample generally, and then there's right. the bassline, I guess. Right. And I mean, this is the way I would kind of consider it. If Ballantine's is a blend of, um, you know, loads of different elements, you've got your grain whiskey, which is kind of keeping it light, you've got your single malts, which are giving it their like real character and texture. Like, so this single malt, Glen Livet, that goes in here, I feel like this could be, you know, something like, a jazz tune and you're t gonna take a cut out of that and then place that in here and create a, you know, an ensemble piece. I think you could, you could use that as an example. The only problem is that that's a single malt, right? And yeah. so jazz wouldn't be a single player, right? So, that, so you may say that, that Genevieve is more like a Miles Davis solo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly, you, you, yeah. This, so this is like, yeah, an yeah, Amir Jamal key for yeah, like, yeah, that's just for one, one bar. Yeah. yeah, he just, blah, blah, he just gave yeah, you a yeah. solo and you took that and you put that in there, then maybe you got a Thelonious Monk piano yeah. and you threw that in there, yeah, and maybe yeah. you got a Charles Mingus bass and you threw that in there, yeah. along with some James Brown drums and Al Green voice sample, and now you're talking. And then you, yeah, yeah, and then you go here. <laughs> so if we move on to the 30 year old, I've not tasted this. This is beyond 30 years, let's be clear. This is yeah. 30 years, 20 years ago. This was a minimum of 30 years in barrels. It's been 40 years since this was bottled. Right. But yeah, it still remains a 30-year-old whiskey. But, but if we look at when these were distilled, it's going to be like 
the 1950s right. for the most part. So when we was doing the Ballantine at the distillery, uh, they took me to another like place where they had barrels stored underground. Mm -hmm. And it's not a lot of barrels either. Yeah. The one that we opened that day was from the year 1976. Oh yeah. Yeah, we took out one Valanche. Yeah. We drunk some at first. <laughs> but it was amazing for me to see the patience of a craftsmanship. Mm. To sit there and have something wait yeah. before the world can taste it or experience it. I thought that was very cool. Yeah. You know, it's obviously it's been in the bottle. This has been in the bottle for 40 years. Right. That's been in the barrel previous to that for 30 years. Right. And even those barrels, if you take a barrel from Spain, right. you, having sherry go through it for about 25 years before that, it was a tree. Right. And it probably took, yeah, 200 years to yeah. grow that tree, 200 yeah. years before it was an acorn. Yeah. And I think the amount of history locked into all of this is pretty, pretty fascinating. Well, I don't know who called the spirits first, but uh, I can see why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to putting values on whiskeys, Age is a big factor, rarity is a big factor, um, and vintage is also gonna be important. For whiskey, 1926 is kind of the, the gold standard. That's the number one vintage. Okay, um, and not to talk numbers here, but what, what kind of, you know, how would you open up an auction or something like that? Would somebody, would you start the bidding, like start the bidding at $10,000 a bottle? For this one or for the 1926? For the 26. But yeah, so the last time we sold uh, 1926, I think the low estimate was, it was in the UK as well, mm -hmm. it was in pounds. So the low estimate was uh, 750,000 and nice. it ended up selling for 2.2 .2 million pounds total. Well, that's great. Yeah, yeah. So this doesn't have a vintage on it. This is non-vintage. Right. And if you add on these things, you know, rarity, age, well, I was gonna vintage. Throw that at you. What yeah. about the rarity of the bottle? Like, you know, this here, this seven year bottle, I, I think there's a definite limited edition. Yeah, yeah. So there's gonna be a time when you can't find it. Yeah, I guess a little Rizzo signature on it. Oh, a signature on the right? <laughs> <laughs> when I smell it, you know, we were talking about who's the old school of hip hop, what's the like old style? This is what you get with whiskey as well. Like there's something that I find very hard to put into words. We just talk about it as OBE, which, mm. which stands for Old Bottle Effect. Mm. There's a dustiness and a kind of tropicaliness. Yeah, I mean. There's, there's this like, I don't know if you can taste it like a slightly sort of barbecue pineapple or like uh, bruised papaya or, um, and even a little bit of dustiness behind it. Well, I'm not as, uh, as uh, you know, as elevated as you in, in, the, in, the, in the nose palate of it, but when you said barbecue, I definitely like something I smell, I guess the age. I yeah. guess that's the best, because I don't have the yeah. total I mean, yeah, it's, the reference. It's, it, even for me, it's really hard to describe yeah. it. It just smells old. Yeah. There, there is something dusty. It's like, you know, like finding an old, old vinyl. book. Or, yeah, old, old vinyl. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's exactly that. Well, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. Slangeva. Slangeva. Slangeva, I'm getting close. <laughs> One of the things you can really feel here, like you said, you get evaporation over time. Mm -hmm. in the barrel, but you also get it in the bottle. It is, a fa it is fascinating, you know, how long some stuff sits in the barrel and how much you lose. Yeah. They say like, you know, five, 10 percent goes up to the angels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, not, not even just from the barrels, but even from the bottles like this probably was filled into the neck, you know, back 40 years ago when it went in the right. bottle. And like even these, you know, we talk about wine aging in the bottle. You know, you'll buy good vintages, store them and, and allow them to develop. Whiskies 100% do the same, but no one, will, no one from a whiskey company will ever tell you that. But even that bit of evaporation, over time I feel like actually the alcohol level has even I'm dropped a little bit below. A low? So, or, yeah, uh, a little, no, a bit below. Because the alcohol will distill before the water? Yeah, it'll evaporate really quickly. So one thing for me was the two different explosions. So where this exploded uh, more singular and it went nasal quick, this actually spread a little bit before right. it went nasal. Yeah, yeah. So, no. Yeah, sort of kind of palate yeah, coating. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this is Glenlivet Cellar Collection. This is uh, 38 years old, so this is the oldest one out of the nice. three. 1981 vintage. That's funny because I think in 1981, I may have just gotten my first turntable or something. Oh, yeah? I had to sell newspapers and you know, hustle to get up about 60 bucks and I, to get a straight arm turntable, which is the worst ones you could buy yeah. these days. You're supposed to have the curve on. Yeah, they've they been on time. Yeah. yeah, but I got I got it, man. And I stayed up all night just playing vinyl and 
all that. And eventually I became a DJ, you know, before I became a producer. Yeah. Yeah. And then what was your journey in? Like, did you become producer first, rapper second? Like, what was your No, it was, it was rapper first. Uh -huh. You know, I was blessed to hear hip hop at, at, a, at, a, at the age of seven. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was eight, I, 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 I was quoting other guys' lyrics, yeah. <laughs> right? But when I was nine, I wrote my first lyric at the age of nine. Yeah. Of course, it's about a girl, meet a young girl with the big old breasts. <laughs> so my brain was, <laughs> was over there at the moment. But um, yeah, so it was writing lyrics first and then realizing that the lyrics needed beats and accompaniment, mm. uh, which the DJ provided. So me and my brothers, we just was hustling to get the turntable so we could make our mixtapes and things yeah. of that nature, yeah. Those are very powerful years. Uh, but if you're talking about 38 years, what, what would the, what, That's gonna be 1985, 1985, 1986. Oh, this is for me, this is Eric B and Rakim. Mm -hmm. This is KRS-One. This is, uh, this is the first wave of the golden age. Mm -hmm. This is when hip hop is starting to have, have a, a broader identity. And the lyrics and the music is not simple. This is when the sampler is now possible to be in the studio. Before, before it was able to be in your studio, you know, it was this big. And it, you'll never get a chance to get it at home. But in 86, you start getting home versions. Uh, I think it had a maximum of uh, 10 to 12, or 12 seconds of sample time. Mm -hmm. Where now you can just use your phone, right? And talk right, yeah, all day. Yeah, yeah. So imagine these songs that you gotta take your idea and stuff it mm -hmm. into this. And it, so the average hip hop loop, if you go doom, doom, da, doom, 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 da, that's four seconds. Yeah. Your time is gone already. You done took one third of your time just on the drum pattern. Mm -hmm. So what we learned to do in those days where well, we would speed it up to 78 and then slow it back down. Yeah. Right, so learning to control time. Um, so that's what, you know, that's where my mind goes as a great year of hip hop because technology had entered the arena and the ability to loop mm -hmm. and create and pull from, instead of just two turntables, you could pull from any source. That was a, a pioneer year of that. Yeah. Oh, that second one, I gotta get more comfortable for this next one. <laughs> ah, man. So this is our first single malt, and we should be able to tell this a little bit differently. Right. With single malt, there's a kind of biscuity, cereally element to it. Well, we said biscuit, I didn't understand it. But cereal, you're, you're right. Yeah. And it smells, this smells closer to the distillery smell you'll get yeah. when you walk in the distillery. Uh -huh. When you walk through a distillery, um, obviously you have your, your various areas of, of production, and there's one where, and they create a beer, which then goes on to be distilled. And there's a quite tart, uh, citric flavor that you get uh, you know, in the air in that room. And you get it in the glass here quite a lot. I agree. Yeah. Shall we? Let's do it. Slangeva. Slangeva. Again, this one's pretty easy. The ABV is low. It's pretty, pretty approachable, pretty easy drinking. It definitely has more, I would say, citrus um, mm. than we had in these two. Yeah. Uh, probably with your blend, more creaminess right. and a little bit more smoke. There's no smoke in here. Yeah. It's a little bit more fresh orchard fruits, pears, apples, yeah. a little bit of squeeze of lemon, a fresh single malt. I'm interested to hear about how, what you thought of Scotland. You said you spent a week there. Yeah, uh, Scotland was a great trip for me for various reasons. Once, one, I had my wife accompany me. Okay. And we stayed in an old castle. Yeah. And then I had a chance to go and feed the reindeer. <laughs> okay, I've never done that. Yeah, I fed the reindeer, yeah. and at the and so in, in the MPC, which is a, a yeah, drum machine, the, okay, yeah. and it has a speaker built in, meaning you could take it with you and just play in the car. Yeah, yeah. I took it to the top of to the side of this uh, pasture of reindeer, and fed the reindeers and made a track, and they all gathered around me like they was like, yo, it was fucking. With it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and I ended up writing a poem about it. Yeah, and that's written on the. Uh, yeah, around this bustle, yeah, right? Yeah, and I will, yeah, yeah. I will, yeah that, 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 that came from the purity. You know, I mean, the country's, what, 900 years minimum for, for some of those cities? And you're looking at structures that's hundreds of years old. You're looking at land that was fought over 
you know, blood that was spilled mm -hmm. on it, happiness and children that was raised from it, yeah. cultures born of it, royalties, and all these different things. And for me, I was, it, was, it was fascinating. But look, this was great, taking me through the history of this and all these different flavors. We reached down there, I actually bought something for you to taste. So I'd like to introduce you to a new friend of mine. <laughs> it's called Vrela, and it's, these are tequilas. Have a Blanco, have a Reposado, and have an Anejo. Taste this Blanco, mm -hmm. and then let me know from your taste buds, can you taste flavor in it? Because most Blancos is just... Yeah, yeah they're yeah, clean, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Don't, you don't want to sip it. Mm -hmm. I propose that this is a sippable Blanco. Okay, do you want me to do the honors? Yes, please. All right. I think this is one of those tequilas that you can do on a Wednesday night and just sip yeah. after work. So and t tell me what you think. It's interesting, especially coming off the whiskey, like instantly there's the very recognizable tequila-y nose. Right, right. Which is like, um, there's sort of a waxiness I get, like a green bell pepper kind of mm -hmm. thing. Certainly like lemony, but it's, it's more like um, lemon rind, lemon peel, lemon curd, not, rather than like lemon juice. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that waxier, Style well, the word the waxy concept. was perfect. It's yeah. almost like, because that's an undescribable smell, but yeah. waxy, you could get the idea of what the smell could be. Yeah, There's, it's not sweet, but there is a kind of corn, like a fresh mm. corn kind of flavor. Yeah, I mean, it smells clean. Like this smells like, you know, exactly what you're looking for in, a, in like a sippable tequila. Shall we? Should we do it? What do you say? We'll, we'll just say cheers. Cheers. Yeah, okay. we'll cheers. <laughs> yeah, actually the sweetness in the palate is really discernible. There's almost like a, very clean, like white sugar or um, icing sugar kind of mm. uh, kind of sweetness that just cuts through, you know, the heat of the alcohol and right. uh, and that citrusy note. I always taste something floral in it. I don't know if you kind yeah. of chance to taste that. Yeah, floral. I mean, yeah, for like an elderflowery yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But very interesting as a sipper, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna skip the reposado, and I want you to taste the anejo, which people know anejo is known for sipping anyway. Mm -hmm. But you know, tequila. It has a reputation of harshness. And, uh, this is more mature. And yeah, it's called like Vrelo, which translates in English as flight, right? To mm -hmm. fly. And this wing logo is to give you the idea that tonight, after drinking this, you should be able to fly and <laughs> soar yeah. the heavens of your mind, you know? What was the impetus behind getting into tequila? My wife. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, her friend and her husband, um, Brevin Block, they, you know, been family friends, you know, since since my son was one, mm -hmm. you know, and and they've been best friends for years. And during the pandemic, he brought this over and we tasted it, and it was like, wow, this is uh, delicious, and we love tequila. And so uh, my wife was like, do you guys need help? And I said, well, we don't need help, but this is family, and mm -hmm. uh, we would love for you guys to join. And my wife joined, and eventually, after, after about 50 bottles later that I consumed, I said, you guys need me to do anything? Because <laughs> I want to share it with the world. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's so like... Less smell, though, right? Now, the smell didn't punch out on this. Oh, it's, it's still um, quite expressive, but it's less noticeably or discernibly like classic tequila. Like, right. there's something additional. There's actually kind of like a... Almost like a... A, a sort of sodery, like a root beery, or a, even like a slightly Coca Cola y thing happening That's on the top. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I think this is, this is your barrel it's maturation. Barrel, this is the, the barrel, word coming yes, in there. Yes. Yeah. I like, I like that root beer idea that you said. Because um, we're still in an oak barrel, and, and mm. root beer is, is, is basically pop sodas mm. coming from a barrel. But it's very interesting that you noticed that, because I, I couldn't put my finger on that, and that uh, you got a very keen nose, because it is something root beery about it. Mm. Uh, not in a sweet, dark yeah, it's way. Not, yeah, it's not like an artificial, confected yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. It's more like, um, yeah, there's a slightly, I guess, uh, there's a richness in here, which is, you know, difficult to, I guess, put your finger on without without using flavor notes like right. root beer. <laughs> like, I mean, this is the thing to describe something unique in itself, you have to draw from other places right, right. to be able to, you know, build like a constellation of vocabulary that will you know, do justice to what you're drinking. Oh, that's good, by the way. <laughs> hey, actually, it's quite gingery. See, I taste the ginger. I yeah, did, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't, this guy is good. I couldn't identify <laughs> some of the flavors, but you're right, I, there's a gingery mm. thing that's going on. And not ginger to a burn, yeah, yeah. but just yeah, to yeah. an opening up of your, of your, of yeah, your yeah. yeah, that's actually 
Really nice. This is, this is an eye opener for me because when I go for brown spirits, I'm pretty much exclusively single malt whiskey, cognac, um, maybe some rums, occasionally an American whiskey, but I tend to right. lean further Stay to, home, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got European taste, yeah. Um, so this is pretty interesting. Great. Well, it's a dance, right? I guess everything we, you know, we do, mm. we, you know, it's a dance of trying to share and bring. Speaking of a dance, uh, here's a nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're working on something new, something like totally different from, I guess, what everyone would think of when they think of the RZA. You have a new album, uh, it's called The Ballet Through Mud. My first ballet that I wrote, something that I definitely wouldn't have predicted of myself. Once again, during the pandemic, being at home and I dug up this old lyric book. It's a book of lyrics that I started writing when I was maybe 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So it covers from the age of 14 to 19. And all the things that I was experimenting with and experiencing, you know, love for the first time, sex, drugs, mm -hmm. all these different things. And they're here. And I started reading them. And I said I should put music to it. And so I started out with that idea. But then as, I, as the music developed, uh, it became his own thing. And, and yeah. there was a famous quote that I learned from Shaolin, uh, Bodhidharma, who was the, he's an Indian monk who left India. Mm -hmm. He travels to China. The legend says he walked. And when he got there, he was disfigured, tall, dark, disfigured, you know, maybe Sri Lankan in appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, and he got to the Buddhist temple known as Shaolin, where they were all prestigious, dressed in white robes and garments. And the symbol of Buddha is the lotus. Yeah. And they was talking all their wisdom, you know, emptiness, void, and all that. And Bodhidharma wanted to add his wisdom to the conversation. And they looked at him and was like, ah, because he was all dirty, covered in mud yeah. from the travel. It was like a monk should never be defiled by mud. <laughs> And he looked at them and he responded. He said, the lotus grows out of the mud, mm -hmm. right? Which is their symbol, which is true. In all that defilement, the purity of the lotus still grows. And that idea permeated my uh, music. And so this is called the ballet through mud because it's very, who would think that the RZA from the slums of Shaolin, <laughs> right? Bring the motherfucking ruckus. Wu Tang Clan ain't nothing to fuck with. Is going to sit there and create something that's just beautiful, elegant, uh, and pure. Yeah, so that's my new album. Now. I hope you get a chance to cool. listen to it and yeah, enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> right, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Well, I'd say this sometime when I drink as well. I say bong bong. Bong bong. Cheers. What if there was another world out there? What if connecting with others helps you connect more deeply to the world? What if your journey starts here? Silver Sea.